Hello world, it's Dave again, and I got another book review for you here this time, which is How to Rewire Your Brain. Really interesting book that I read recently, and uh, a lot of practical knowledge that you can take from it afterwards. So, of course, it's not very often that I criticize a book and don't recommend it. I figure, why would I even post that to, like, to warn people? I prefer to focus on things that I think are great. Um, and this book really was. And I went into it thinking, I read not too long ago this book called... Um, the brain that changes itself. And that book was definitely kind of a case study of all these interesting different people. And I've got a few videos on my channel in regards to that book talking about uh, neuroplasticity and uh, those kind of things. But it was not in the self-help vein. It was just kind of exploring these different uh, medical cases where when I started to read this book, realized very quickly, it is a self-help book, but not kind of the standard type that you'd find where I think a lot of self-help is sort of a, I call it like a theoretical approach or, um, you know, they come at it from sort of a social perspective that isn't based in on, on any hard evidence so much as a, a precedent, a social precedent that they've seen before. Whereas this book is self-help, but it's with all this scientific backing to it and the study of neuroplasticity kind of running parallel to the self-help advice that it offers. And so it's got a particular weight to its advice, I felt. And it was really, really useful. Um, you know, here and there, it shed some new light. I would say this first off, if you want to go into a heavy discussion of neuroplasticity or a more heavy discussion as opposed to, you know, how you can apply this practically to your life, I would recommend that other book, which is How the Brain That, Change it, the brain that Changes Itself. But if you want to use neuroplasticity as it relates to your life, you could read this book, How to Rewire Your Brain, and get a lot of really, really good, interesting use out of it. And uh, I'll just discuss one or two things that struck me as really, really interesting. So to begin with, you go through life, and you, and you, you kind of create this philosophy as to how you might live your life well, and the, uh, the sort of approaches you would take to different social situations, and you do them, like I say, on sort of a precedent, but you don't have them. It's hard. Well, for me personally, I've never had any sort of scientific backing uh, to to uh, support what I thought. Whereas this now, this book gives you basically scientific evidence to support the value of positive thinking. Um, where things, you know, like old idioms, old mantras that you might have had, you know, uh, for example, like, you know, if you're afraid of some, do something every day that scares you. And a lot of people say this, and we assume that it's healthy, but we don't know why. We just have this feeling, and we've seen that it's been, people are better off when they do this than were they to stay at home scared. <laughs> so the way that this book approaches that is to give you the actual psychological, neurological science as to why that is true. Um, and that section of the book is basically related to avoidance. And without going deep, deep into it. It's basically the idea that we have, um, which most people, everybody's heard of, is the fight or flight response to, um, to any sort of stress that we have. And I've said, or thought myself in the past, that a lot of our fear comes from a sort of, sort of a vestigial need to defend ourselves when we were in a cave and to be afraid meant the difference between life and death. It meant if you went out and there was a saber-toothed tiger or lion or whatever it's called out there, that you would be afraid and you would be anxious, and that would save your life. But now, in today's day and age, where there's less things that could actually literally kill us, that fear, that mechanism in us to be stressed or feared in these kind of fight-or-flight, or what we view as fight-or-flight situations, are completely unnecessary. We don't need them, and because we now are able to protect ourselves better than we might have in the past, we overprotect ourselves. And so the example that they give in the book is if you want to uh, say you're afraid of uh, social situations where there's a lot of people and somebody suggests to you over the phone, let's go out to a party. Now you're going to get this response as though there were a mountain lion outside of your cave, which tells you to be afraid because we have that old system built into us, but now it's relating to us going to a party as opposed to defending our lives from, you know, stupidly going out into that kind of uh, danger. And you get halfway out the door, 
and you get you get in your or you don't get halfway to the door. You get into your car. You then um, you then drive halfway to the party, and you you would then kind of think to yourself, you know, you, the fear is mounting as you approach the situation that's going to happen, and you make the choice at that point to to turn the car around. You really don't want to have anything to do with it. And so what has happened in that point, as the book describes psychologically, is that you've, you're always teaching your brain, basically. And what you've taught your brain at that point is that if this kind of thing comes up, you can avoid it and you can get relief. And the book kind of suggests that this is particularly dangerous because of that temporary belief or relief, sorry, that makes you think you've solved the problem. But what you've actually done is to train your mind to have an, a response that it knows that first it's going to stress you out when this happens and you know a stress you out when it happens and b to because the eventual response like what you were most happy with is when you finally flee from the situation that it should probably kick that response in sooner so when at first you might be experiencing this when you get halfway to the party the next time somebody brings it up to you you're going to get a fear as you reach the door handle and it's going to demand even louder that you avoid the situation. Um, you know, all like pumping through your body, all the hormones from your fight or flight response. And then you, you decide at that point, you don't even get out the door. You don't get halfway to the party. You get to the door. You decide, okay, I'm going to avoid this ah, temporary relief. You know, and immediately you calm down because you know that you're not going to go to this party. But then the next time someone hasn't even phoned you, but you know this weekend that there's probably going to be a party. And just your thinking about the party can trigger this fight or flight response until you, you basically continually corner yourself um, and make it worse and worse and worse and your reaction stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's uh, it can be done with anything, you know, whether it would be in social situations. It's anything that you sort of have that, that fear of that you don't confront. And it's not just hypothetical. It's like hormonally you're teaching your body to respond in this way. So I found that very interesting. So when somebody says to you, you know, go, go out every day and do something that scares you, you should because in, you know, the opposite way, you will train yourself to realize that there is really nothing to be afraid of and you will overcome that fear, you know, provided uh, nothing horrendous happens. Like, I mean, if you went to the party and then something really horrible did happen, that's kind of the danger of the real world is that then you would get a strong association, but you know, nine times out of 10, you're going to go to that party and it would probably be okay. Or you're going to go to that piano recital, or you're going to give that speech in front of people. It doesn't matter what it is. It's likely that the greater fear is imagined in your head. And so I saw how that old quote really had scientific value to it. And I thought for myself, when I'm, I'm in Japan and I'm learning English, there's a big act of avoidance that I usually have when uh, trying to speak the language, you know, I go out the door and it's, it's just really intimidating to speak to people and you're afraid that you're going to sound stupid and this and that and the other thing. But I've made a point now that I should could try and scare myself. And when I go to the gym, when I go to the, the town hall, even if it's horrible, I just speak to people. And I've noticed even with, within a short period of time, I actually thought it would take longer but that I've been able to uh, to confront the fear and work through it quickly. So now I think I've definitely noticed that when I think about speaking to people in random situations, I am far less afraid of it and starting now to reverse it where in the odd time that I've, you know, done quite well, I'm starting to now look forward to those situations. And of course that's healthier. Of course I'm going to, uh, you know, progress more quickly with the language, all these other things. Um, so that's one example from the book where I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. That's um, the kind of thing we always hear. But now I know it to be true is based on our fight or flight response and the sort of chemicals that are released into our body and the way in which you train yourself each time that you confront a situation like this. So that's one thing. So the second thing that I'll talk about um, is uh, what was it? Stress. Now, this was really interesting. I found this in the book. So. You know, the, it's interesting how the pendulum swings. I love that phrase, the pendulum swings. Um, how when, you know, and call it like 1950s, 1914, in the uh, like early modern era, I guess you would call it, there was kind of this feeling that more stress was good. It was really, really, really good. Um, and that's like the healthiest person is someone who's got tons on their plate and is always doing something. And in fact, uh, mental illness was usually looked at 
in the fact that if someone they didn't have enough of a job, you know, it was like that's usually what you prescribe to somebody with a mental illness was that they should get out and do some hard labor, and that would that would fix their brain. <laughs> um, and now, vice versa, you come to the, like the modern, the now, and where most people in our worlds that are so busy, the pendulum has swung the other direction, and we think that you know that's actually we we have identified that is incredibly unhealthy. We think that that's really really bad. And there's a lot of evidence to support when you look at things like uh, like when you smoke a cigarette, one of the uh, the classic things you hear is that it spikes your cortisol. And we know that these um, cortisol has the effect of making you kind of like uh, more alert, all these other things. And when you have great, great doses of it, it makes you agitated. And what this book says, the science behind these sort of like agitating hormones in your body is that yes, they do make you agitated. They do make you more alert when you're in a stressful situation, but Everything is there for a reason. And so where before we thought, oh, all you need is stress. And now we thought, no, we don't need stress at all. We need to completely remove it from our lives. What this book actually suggests is there is a middle path to stress. And actually a little bit of stress is a good thing. And we should realize how it's used. So what these, uh, I think it's norepinephrine and cortisol and maybe one other. I, and I confuse between whether they're neurotransmitters or hormones, but they work off each other. Anyways, you can read the book to get those specific details, but I will capture the main idea. And that is basically this. So when you do something, say for example, you're playing a chess match and you're against an opponent who's quite talented and this is a big event and you are getting stressed as you reach the conclusion of the game. Let's make this a positive story. So you're getting stressed and stressed and stressed, but you finally make the correct move under extreme stress to, to take the guy out and win the championship. And what this book suggests was that when you're stressed, one of the, there's, it's called BNFA. That's like the acronym for it, I believe. Something else is released when you, uh, when you, when you have these stressful, uh, neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters released in your brain that speeds up the connections between your neurons and leaves a long-lasting impression. And basically, without with stripping down all this, you know, this jargon surrounding it, you learn more quickly when you're stressed. And so when you're learning guitar and you're playing a very difficult song and you feel a bit stressed, that's making you learn more quickly. Uh, when you when you are... Uh, working in a restaurant in the service industry and you were in the shit, everybody says, you know, once you've survived being in the shit, then you're way better at your job. It's because in the time that you were really stressed in that job, you, you learn far, far more quickly. And so I realized from this that stress has its place. It's not that we should be overstressed because it explains very clearly in the book that if you're overstressed and you're constantly in these conditions, it breaks down your neural pathways, it's bad. But just the right amount of it in proper doses gets us to learn more quickly. So we should not aim to completely remove stress from our lives, nor should we just fill it utterly to the brim with it, but we should find a middle path where it helps us to learn. And that was really interesting for me. I'd never thought that before. I was always of the mind, kind of what, which is popular now, you know, like 24-7 yoga, only healthy, blah, 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 blah. All these things that would utterly remove stress from your life, but it's not actually healthy. They said these, these chemicals also um, kind of maintain our neural pathways, you know, so, it, and I mean, it stands to reason that if there's nothing to worry about and you're absolutely stressed, you retain less knowledge because you don't need to. There's nothing really to, to worry about. So why would you retain anything? You can just go on as you are, happy and content, um, and that's good enough. So I hope that that's, uh, I've articulated a few points from the book decently, um, why I really liked it and why you can practically apply it to your own life. And it, it was really interesting, you know, that, that's just scratching it. I didn't want to make this like a chapter by chapter uh, exploration of the book, but um, I'll put uh, copy, you know, Amazon and whatever. I'll put the, excuse me, the name of it down below so you can check it out. I think it's an excellent book. Like I say, if you want something a little more serious, a little less self-helpy, go with the brain that changes itself. But this one, if you want some practical use for neuroplasticity, which is a really exciting field in the first place and really current, um, then I would check this book out. And it's a pretty short read too. It's a really short read. And he, I don't, I'm sure he does this on purpose. Maybe he acknowledges like the, the uh, attention span of most people reading the book, but no chapter is any bigger than like six pages. So you feel like you're constantly progressing quickly through the book. 
Uh, so that's my review. That's my recommendation. It was very cleverly written, lots of practical stuff, and good backing for many of these idioms and, you know, sort of things that we assume just because we've heard them before, but now we got the evidence. All right, so if you, uh, if you enjoyed the review, as you hear from everyone, please do like, subscribe, share, comment. Maybe you've read the book. Maybe you had some other uh, insight into it that I didn't that you found interesting. I always like that. And any sort of book recommendations, I always welcome that too. I've got a bunch of recommendations from people now, and that's great. All right, so uh, until we meet again next time, I've got a couple more reviews coming because I did finish a couple other books recently and haven't been keeping up to date. Thanks for tripping with Dave. Ciao for now. Peace.